Welcome to another episode of the Jay and Rob Toy Show. And this episode is, oh, I can't wait to dive into it, ladies and gentlemen. But let me bring my space mutant brethren, my brother from the planet Primus, to join the discussion. This, of course, is Mr. Jay Bartlett. Hello, good sir. How are you today? Uh, you know, I love talking about the thing that we're going to be talking about, so I'm ready to get talking about it. Let's dive in, man. I know you love it. I love it. Let's get to it. We are continuing our discussion of all things Masters of the Universe. In a previous episode, we talked Vintage Masters, 2002 Masters, and Masters of the Universe Classics. And some of you might be saying, well, what could possibly be left? Those are the three big lines. Well, the truth is there is a lot more Masters to discuss. We're going to be looking at new adventures, the 2000 commemorative releases. We're going to be looking at Staction figures, Masters of the Universe Origins, and their latest line, Masters of the Universe Masterverse figures. So, Jay, let's, let's start back in a humble time known as 1989 when He-Man apparently decided to leave Eternia. What do you remember about the toy line simply titled He-Man? Well, this was a strange time, not only because I was growing up and kind of growing out of toys that weren't so cool anymore, but uh, they were trying to, Mattel was trying to relaunch the Masters of the Universe line and went to the drawing board with a whole bunch of ideas and came back with He-Man in Space. I'm not necessarily against this, and I've seen quite a few of the cartoon episodes. It's not bad. It's not bad. My problem lies with the way the toys actually look, and uh, some of the characters are pretty odd. When He-Man, the toy line, and the cartoon show, the new adventures of He-Man came out, for me, it was full stop. Like, breaks Fred Flintstone feet through the car. This is not He-Man. I don't know what this is. This looks completely different. It feels completely different. The toys look nothing like the original toys, even though it's Mattel still producing them. Different animation company this time around. It just, it was, I don't understand how I'm supposed to, to follow along with this. The story in New Adventures is a continuation of everything that we saw in the Filmation original series, but it was very different. What, what were some of the differences that you saw, Jay, in the toys? Well, the toys were much smaller, and they, they were much more sleek. They actually remind me of a lot of the Princess of Power characters, uh, Bo, for instance. Bo has a striking resemblance to the New Adventures He-Man figure, both in size and shape. They were tiny, so as a kid, all the things that you really loved about He-Man, first and foremost, I would say was he was strong. That was his thing, right? He was like Superman. And while he was still strong in the new adventures, his physique was a lot more sleek. It was a lot more tapered inward. And uh, it just wasn't quite as striking to me. The toys did not look special. They looked like any other action figure that you could have pulled off the shelf with a futuristic sci-fi, you know, tone to it. This could have been any Marvel Toy Biz superhero. It could have been a slightly bigger superpowers figure. Uh, you know, it just looked very stiff. It didn't exactly scream action or power. And it didn't, it didn't beg me to play with it as a kid. Now, even looking back at it as an adult, I'm not really drawn to the line. There are a few highlights that I like, and it shouldn't shock anybody that they're the play sets. Sure. Nordor, which is this big meteor yeah. uh, play set, kind of like the Technodrome, opens up, and there's three platforms in which you can uh, position people on, the characters like Skeletor or Flog or Optic, uh, and then you can close it up. And one cool feature is you can actually look through the holes of the meteor and see into it. So it's kind of like a closed diorama. Uh, Starship Eternia, uh, which was the good guys place that not only was it a shuttle, but you could uh, reconfigure it. It was modular, so it became a tower. And the story, according to the mini comics, was that the power of Grayskull transformed into this spaceship and it shot out of Grayskull and helped uh, time travel to the future uh, where He-Man and Skeletor were both taken. I, it just, it didn't connect to me. It was too much of, of a departure. And the toy line specifically was a radical shift from, from what we were used to seeing that was you know so flavorful. The toy line, the very first wave, uh, did very well. And specifically, 
If I'm not mistaken, the greatest toy to sell was the Power Sword, which was like their live action role playing sword that you would actually carry. That was the biggest seller in the line for the first wave. And then after that, after the first 10 characters, it kind of just went downhill. But I'm with you. I don't necessarily have a problem with new characters. You don't need Merman, Beast Man, Trap Jaw, and all that stuff. But the characters have to be somewhat cool looking. And you're right, these guys, they look like. Uh, just cheap knockoffs of space aliens. I mean, even He-Man, like I said, he kind of looked like Bo. They just wasn't very imaginative to me. I agree, and I think even Mattel realized that they had to backtrack a bit because the first release of the He-Man figure was slender and unmuscular as we had come to know him, like you yeah. said, comparing to the Bo figure from Princess of Power. But later releases of, of He-Man, I think like Power Punch or Thunder Punch He-Man, yeah. he was jacked and like full of like yeah. helium or something because he looked like he had muscles everywhere suddenly and it's like, okay, well, I guess they're trying to beef him up. That went away very quickly. It didn't do that well. There were 65 episodes of the cartoon, which sounds like a lot, but it was only one season. And then He-Man went to sleep for a very long time until nostalgia kicked in in the year 2000 and we got these re-releases of the vintage figures, these commemorative mm. Uh, figures that looked identical to the originals. It came on card back, but they were put into a slip cardboard case as well that was all black and had a, a nice scroll kind of lettering on it and had the legend of Grayskull and everything on the back. It was a really interesting thing to see at that time for someone like me who grew up with He-Man to see like, oh, these are the same figures I had as a kid. What do you remember about seeing all those 2000 era commemorative figures? Yeah, the, the, the way they were packaged, the way they were housed, you weren't supposed to open these. That was very clear, 100%. So this was one of the first toy lines as the adult collecting uh, phenomenon took over, where it was like, you bought this specifically to stay in a box, to put it on your shelf, to hang it up, whatever you wanted to do, but you weren't gonna open this thing. Uh, I don't know many people, if any, that did, because around 2000, I mean, the vintage line had been gone for a decade, but it's still, you could still go and easily find at flea markets and stuff like that back then, you know, the vintage master stuff for relatively cheap. So if you wanted loose versions of those figures, that was easy. But these ones, it was all about the packaging and the nostalgia of remembering what they look like on their card backs. I want to jump forward. We've already talked about 2002, that anime influence line where He-Man came back in a big way the first time Mattel really tried to get behind it 10 years after He-Man and the new adventures of He-Man. That line fizzled out. After 39 episodes of the cartoon, 2002 He-Man went away, but the fans were still there. And NECA teamed up with the Four Horsemen to release additional figures. Jay, do you know which ones I'm talking about here? I do. It's one that I know you're such a huge fan of. Would it be the Staction line? Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, do you know what that phrase Staction means, Jay? It's a combination of statue and action figure all into one, which is kind of cool because we're not supposed to be playing with these anyway, am I right? That's right, they don't have any points of articulation at all. So these were very specifically made for fans and adult collectors. And you know, Jay, you and I love the Horde. And yeah. the stacks in line features the Horde characters in 2002 style, and they're just phenomenal. Do you yeah. have a, a favorite one that, that really speaks to you from this line? Oh, Hordak, absolutely. Hordak's my favorite villain, and I think the way that they've designed him, I, I like the vintage Hordak, but, but this one got it exactly right, and uh, it's a figure that I wish I had. I'm definitely on the lookout for it. I don't have many Staction figures, but I would have to go with Hordak. I can tell you with 100% honesty, these might be the most collectible uh, figures out there in the Masters of the Universe community. Everybody that caught the 2002 show when they were, you know, in their late teens or late 20s, depending on when you grew up, loves these things. They are hard cool. to find. They weren't at mass retail. The articulation, again, is non-existent. So all the effort goes into details and the accessories. And there's just a presence with every single figure. If you find a Staction figure, you pick it up. It doesn't matter if it's Snow Spout, Clamp Champ, yeah. uh, Sorceress, any of them. Pick them up, put them in your collection, they're cool, and at least they're very collectible, so you should definitely be giving some credence to, to collecting them. Okay, we're gonna fast forward a little bit with the He-Man lines, and we're going to go almost to modern day, 
But at the same time, we're gonna bring it back to the past, to the vintage style. I, of course, Rob, I'm talking about the Masters of the Universe Origins line, one that you're kind of on the fence about here and there, one that I've grown to love. I was in the same boat as you were until I actually got a few, took them out of the package and actually got to pose them and play with them. And they're just such a wonderful line. Uh, they really improve on the vintage line where you can actually stand them up straight now. So you can still have that hulking He-Man, Conan the Barbarian pose but at the same time, you can put them in a variety of different poses as well. Rob, what are your thoughts on Origins? They're a cool figure. They're big, they're bulky, they pose well. They, you, it's always the stand test. Can you put a figure on the table and will it stand there without too much manipulation? Sure. Yeah. It does that, it's good. I've had a lot of trouble with accessories in hands. They fall right out. Um, I don't like the facial expressions on some of the characters' heads. They seem like off. It doesn't really elicit any cool kind of warrior emotion. It just kind of looks like they're irritated. Like, uh, especially Prince Adam. He's just like, uh, and like, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. Uh, I want to see somebody who's heroic and ready to charge into battle. All that said, people are excited for this line. Like you said, I think it's coming down to price point because that is a game changer in the current world we're living in. Price point is huge, and I really do believe that Mattel have targeted two audiences here. I really think they're trying to bring the kids back into um, getting their parents to buy them toys because these feel like they're toys that are meant to be played with. They feel sturdy, you know. Um, while I agree the weapons don't stay in their hands the best, I still think they're really meant to be played with. In Canada here, they're $14.99. 15 bucks, you can do the rule of two easily, right? You can open one, you can display one, and it's basically the price of one Star Wars Black Series or Marvel Legend by Hasbro. I think the line is wonderful. Even the holiest of grails, the Castle Grayskull itself is only 80 bucks. I mean, and it comes with the figure, you really can't go wrong. They even took uh, Battle Cat and gave him articulation. They broke the old Big Jim mold of the cat and they actually made him move, so. I love the line. It would have been cooler if you guys were like in like a Grizzlor and Beastman costume and I, di <laughs> and I didn't know they were Maybe filming. That would be awesome, right? Imaginary play, something kids don't do enough of anymore. I mean, we could definitely talk about the adult market that's prevalent in this room. But for me, especially growing up with action figures, uh, it allowed me to make things up and be creative and uh, now kids are playing video games. They're being told what to do. They're not making up stories. They're not making up characters. They're not being creative. And that, I think, is an issue. Action figures, I think, are still popular, obviously. But as we know, it's mostly the older collector market. I'm not sure how many kids these days are playing with them, unfortunately. Uh, well, obviously, G.I. Joe came on the market and made you know, the first male action figure right there. And I think that started the play pattern that I'm talking about for boys. They were playing with for the lack of a better word, a doll at that point. You know, I think G.I. Joe possibly coined the term action figure, right? I'm not positive, but I'm pretty yeah. So right there, you're kind of giving the boys the right to play with the action figures, and that's what I love about it, is they're creating their own stories. And so G.I. Joe started that, and then for me, my impact was the second wave of G.I. Joe. You know, first wave of Star Wars figures, and then the 80s G.I. Joe figures, the smaller three and three quarter inch articulated. That was my introduction to action figures, so that's really where my love falls, is the three and three quarter inch. Uh, I love six inch now, obviously. I think that's, in size, that was the next evolution, going from three and three quarter up to the six inch. And I think that had to do, at least in my opinion, directly with the collectors. You know, I think the three and three quarter inch works great for play, because you can have vehicles and play sets. When you get up to six, nine, 12 inches, it's hard to create that play environment, basically, that you had with the smaller action figures. So from that, my next milestone was He-Man, obviously, which is where we are here. He-Man was huge, for the lack of a better term right there. Um, he was completely different than anything I played with. You know, I was G.I. Joe Star Wars guy, and then along comes this muscular fantasy guy, and it was uh, just really fresh and new, and it, I was hooked immediately. Uh, I love play sets. Uh, as a kid, I had them. I had Castle Grayskull, I had uh, Bat Caves, I had lots of stuff that I can't recall right now. But I didn't need it because I was happy with my G.I. Joes in the dirt. 
You know what I mean? So is it necessary? No, but I think it's, uh, it's added fun to it basically is what it is. I mean, obviously that goes right into the play sets or for the play value, they're for the younger kids. For the adults, there are some fun things coming out where you can, you know, it's more like a display. It's not a play set, it's a display set maybe. Uh, can I coin that? Uh, but, uh, and I think those are cool. Like I love seeing people's backdrops of their figures where they have customized something to where it looks like the Batcave or it looks like a, a G.I. Joe control panel or something like that. Often, a lot of companies are doing it now, but there used to be a, you could have a really nice looking action figure, but the articulation was kind of crap or you could have a really articulated action figure, but the details and the paint were kind of crap. I think now we're starting to see both coming. I mean, definitely with the 12-inch larger figures, you can do that, but even with the smaller figures that, you know, uh, Four Horsemen, Super 7, that they're coming out with, NECA, uh, I think we're starting to see the, the combination of both of those worlds come together. I'm a collector. I'm an older guy that used to play with action figures, and now I collect them, so there's nothing wrong with it. And that's, But I think that's mainly what's carrying the market today is the you know the adult collectors. Brock, who's the mastermind at Mondo behind all the Motu stuff, uh, he brought me on back when they were doing He-Man and Skeletor. I was one of several designers that worked on it. Um, they've all kind of jumped around from a few different hands. Uh, Merman was awesome because with He-Man and Skeletor, uh, Dave Raposa had done some concept art before me, and I kind of translated that into a design. Uh, with Merman, there was nothing except what was floating around in Brock's head. And I'm pretty sure it's his favorite character, so he was super insistent on a couple things, but it was a blast because I got to start from scratch. It was basically Brock saying, hey, I want to see this, this, and this, and then we, you know, spitballed. I did sketches, went back to Brock, went back and forth. But for me, it was the most fulfilling of the Mondo Motu figures because I had the most to do with the design. And then that one, I, I loved the process so much and I was super, I guess, thrilled with the way it was coming out. Even before the sculpt, uh, I jumped ahead and I did it like a color, you know, color comp of it, which Brock didn't ask for, but I did it anyway. And then uh, it's kind of cool to see that some of the paint schemes kind of stuck with what I imagined early on, so that was kind of fun. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely my favorite Motu figure simply because I had the most to do with it. Well, Origins isn't the only Masters line that's currently going as we record this. There's actually two more. One of them has been released already and it's called Masters of the Universe Masterverse. And they're right now focusing on the Revelation figures, which are based on the characters from the Netflix animated 10 part series. And then there's another He-Man line simply called He-Man in the Masters of the Universe, which is to support the CG more kid centric show. Now, Jay, I don't know if you've seen the figure from the kid centric show uh, where it's He-Man and he's got his long locks and he looks like he's almost like a firefighter. But I'm sure you can at least talk about the Revelation figures that you've seen now in a new seven inch line. That's the the red armor He-Man I've seen pictures of. That's what everyone's kind of yeah. freaking out about. Yes, I've seen pictures of just that specific figure. If it's built for kids, I think that's great. I think we need to get kids playing with toys again and using their imagination a little bit more. Uh, so I think that's fantastic. Probably not for us adult collectors. The Revelation stuff, uh, the Masterverse stuff specifically, I have yet to see one in person. I've yet to hold one. I find it odd that they released Skelegod as the very first uh, figure in the line. At least that's the first one that's showing up at retail. Talk about spoilers there. Um, but I really love Revelations. I love the new versions of the way the characters look. Uh, Tila, Evil Lynn. Uh, Skeletor, I think they all look fantastic. So those I'm definitely looking forward to picking up. I'm on the fence. Again, I don't know that I'm getting something newer or better than I already have in, in my collection. I tell you though, that cartoon series is making it a very hard argument for me not to get them though. So I can't wait to see what else we get, uh, both in terms of figures and in content. And I'm just excited that we literally have three He-Man lines going at the same time. Never could I have said that that was going to be the case. So that is awesome, especially if you're a Masters of the Universe fan. Yeah, Rob, I agree with you. What a great time to be a Masters of the Universe fan. And don't forget the Mega Constructs, which I know you're a huge fan of. Uh, there's just some beautiful characters and play sets in that line as well. Wow, that trademark sound, it's like swords clashing. Maybe it's the power sword clashing with the Havoc staff. That, of course, means it's time for action figure spotlight. And this could be anything. This could be 
uh, something from the He-Man line, the new adventures that is. This could be something from the commemorative releases. This could be Staxions. This could be Origins. This could be Revelations. And you even threw Mega Constructs in there. So Jay, what are you spotlighting for us this episode? Well, this was tough considering I could pick anything from my collection for Masters Universe. But I decided to go with one of your favorite lines, Rob, with the Staxion. And wouldn't you know it, uh, Revelations and the 2002 Masters Universe cartoon made me fall hard in love with Evelyn as a character. I think she's just fantastic. And this is the San Diego Comic Con exclusive Staxion's Evelyn. She is colored in the original vintage style, of course. Uh, she's got some magic, and she even has a little necklace here that has a real chain, which is great. I love her staff. Uh, like you said, these are beautiful figures. As of right now, this is my only Staxion figure, but I couldn't resist. Like you said, I saw her at a comic book shop out of the corner of my eye. I couldn't pass her up. Um, She's just absolutely fantastic. She is awesome. She is gorgeous. She, you know, says, I can take over the world, but right now I'm choosing to see how things play out. And when the time yeah. is ready, I'm going to pounce. Like, yeah. they, the way that the Four Horsemen captured Evelyn in that sculpt is just perfect. And it fits both in the 2002 style and in Masters Universe Revelation style. So it's kind of a timeless sculpt that just really works. And of course, you've got the exclusive version, which is always a nice, nice little bonus for you to have. Absolutely, and it's also important to note that she wasn't born with the name Evil. Well, this might surprise you, but my spotlight is actually gonna come from the Origins line. Despite being on the fence <laughs> and not super convinced, like I said, there's more pros than cons. And it's a pick and choose line for me. And so I have picked a figure and I'm choosing to spotlight it for you. And that this week is Scareglow. Now, Scareglow has a ton of fan support for the, the character. He came out late in the original vintage run. He glows in the dark, which is always a surefire sign to know. This line is probably running out because here's the glow in the dark feature, sure, but yeah. not for Origins. He is an early, early figure release. He's gained nothing but uh, a cult following since the late 80s. He yeah. also makes an appearance in the new Revelation cartoon. He's just menacing. And this was the first figure that I had opened and actually played with. Yeah, I played with the figure. Imagine that. You can play with toys, there not just you go. put them on your shelf. I, I played with them and it, it's impressive. It feels better than a vintage figure because you can manipulate it a bit more. Yeah. And it's just a really cool sculpt. Um, again, I have trouble with the halberd staying in his hand. I'm surprised it hasn't fallen out yet. But I really like the cape. The cape is a soft plastic. It is textured. Oh, his head literally just came off. That's how much we gotta love Origins, ladies and gentlemen. But the cape is cool because it's a really malleable plastic. So uh, my spotlight of the week, headless scare glow, <laughs> apparently. Amazing. And every single Origins figure that comes out, they, they give you a pamphlet where they encourage you to take the heads and the limbs off to make your own master's figure. I forgot to mention that's another thing I love about Origins. Well, there's the proof in the pudding. Everything will fall apart and yep. you can customize it <laughs> to, to your heart's content. So maybe Skeletor's head will go on that at some point. But uh, Scareglow for the win, at least my favorite current Origins figure. Well, that does it for another episode of the Jay and Rob Toy Show. And we've gone to every corner of the Masters of the Universe franchise and it's a lot to handle. But this time, Jay, you have a question for me? I do, absolutely. You, without a doubt, are the master of the universe, so I leave you with this. You can only take one Masters of the Universe figure with you. What's it gonna be? And I'm talking about every single line. You can only pick one, Rob. Who's it gonna be? It's gotta be Prince Adam from Classics. I know everybody's gonna say, Prince Adam, you've got all these warriors and all these people from various dimensions and everything, and you pick the most boring, most civilian kind of guy? Well, the answer is yes. He's the most <laughs> interesting character in the entire universe. He's the one that has the, the biggest secret, and he's gotta you know, hold the weight of the world on his shoulders. If he doesn't show up, the day doesn't get saved. So for me, it's Prince Adam, and I gotta go with the classic iteration. Well done, my friend, well done.